Victoria. A stunning performance, dominating Victoria If you've ever danced, dined, and had fun in Miami, my next guest might be the reason why. He can be best described as the heartbeat of Miami nightlife and hospitality. He's an entrepreneur, restaurateur, keynote speaker, teacher, innovator, businessman, husband, and father. He is Dave Grutman. Hi everyone, and hi Dave, and welcome to Think About It Season 2. I'm very happy to have you on my podcast. We haven't met uh, before that, but I have heard a lot about you. I've seen a lot of your videos on on Instagram. Uh, you are a big tennis enthusiast, I, I can see. Huge, huge, yeah. huge. Yeah, th so thank you so much for being here, and I'm looking forward to our uh, open chat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, season two. This is this is insane. I'm so excited. The show is about you know being open, and I'm really glad that that you agreed to to this interview. I've always been fascinated about learning about people's lives. One of my favorite things has always been to watch interviews of people on YouTube, and uh, one of the ways actually I learned English is by watching TV shows and by watching people's interviews because. You know, in shows you can you can learn how to articulate the humor. Right. With interviews, you can learn more of an academic language. So it's you know kind of putting my passion um, now and meeting you know wonderful people like you. So. Oh, thank you. I wanted to ask you a little bit about you know beginning of your life, how you started. Um, you you were born in Florida. Naples, Florida. It's a retirement community. Uh, most of my friends sadly have passed away because they were 90 years old when I grew up with them. Okay. Because it's a very old retirement city. I know that your mom asked you what you wanted to be when you were a kid and one of the things that you said you wanted to be rich. For me, what I do is not for the money. I do yeah. it because I'm super passionate about it. And yeah, money is a utility from it. And at the end of the day, I'm running a business, that's for sure. But I would... Don't tell this to anybody, but I would do this for free. I love what I do. I mean, it's not really work for me. I, I, I wake up, you know, on the test court at eight and I'm thinking about working. I'm on phone calls before that. And then sometimes I could go to sleep at four or five o'clock in the morning. It's just, but all thinking about my work and that work is, is my lifestyle. It's not like I could separate it really because of the, I'm in the hospitality business. So it's constant. It, it's not nine to five. And one of the things that, you know, I think maybe you can talk a little bit about more is it doesn't come on the first try, you know, it's... No, it's, I, I, I know people always think, wow, you have great nightclubs and restaurants and all this. And I'm like, yeah, but it's not all rainbows and hoes. It's not like this is just the most beautiful, like people think it's an overnight success. First of all, it's two years to design and build a restaurant. It's three years to pay, three to five years to pay back that investment. So... That's a that's a five to seven year where you're working for free yeah. situation, and um, people understand have to understand you have to be a long ball player to really understand that. And look, I have a lot of restaurants and nightclubs and, stuff and hotels, but I opened up a diner. It wasn't working after three months. I had to switch out the concept. So they don't always hit home runs every time, but it's how you get up the next day and, and keep going. Can you tell me a little bit more about the beginning? Um beginning of your career, your first club. Sure. And on the notes that I have, your first club failed. Big time. Yeah, big time. <laughs> and the reason, the reason, can you talk a little bit about the reason? Yeah, so the, what you're getting at is, um, I was running a nightclub company for a long time and I was doing great. These guys were killing it money-wise and all that. And I thought, hey, listen, if I'm turning the needle, I want to be, I want to be an entrepreneur. I'm an entrepreneur. I want to be a partner in that. And they wouldn't make me a partner. But another club said, hey, we're opening a new club, we'll make you a partner. So everything I did when I went to that new club was to show the old guys, look at me, look what you made a mistake on, you should never pass me. But my ethics and my beliefs weren't lined up correctly. And I failed so badly that the old guys bought the club for me. So when I got the opportunity to take live at the Fountain Blue, I said, you know what? I'm not gonna worry about anybody else. I'm gonna do what I do great. Your type of work, hospitality, it's, uh demanding health-wise sure. and uh, 
I've read and I've seen obviously how how much you've transformed sure. your your lifestyle into an exemplar, I, I believe, for your kids. Sure. I think for me, it's about it's not about balance or so. It's just, it's my life. So I try to get on a regiment where it's it's consistent. I tennis every morning at eight o'clock. Even if I work till three or four o'clock in the morning, I still go to tennis at eight a.m. And to me, that's important. I always do my weights at six p.m. So I try to keep those as my boundaries, and it helps me with my boundaries too, right? If I know I have to be, I have to be at tennis at 8 a.m., there's certain things I'm not gonna do at night. Was that the challenge to get to this point or at any You know, it's funny, I took up tennis during COVID, mm -hmm. and I was in Amanyar and Turks, and I started hitting the ball with a trainer, and I felt the top spin, and I'm like, wow. And once you get passionate about it, it doesn't, again, it doesn't seem like a bound, it doesn't seem like, because well, I'm so excited to go play. And I love it. So I'm not, I don't love lifting weights anymore as, like, as much as I used to, but I know I have to because at the end of the day, I'm a chubby Jewish guy that just wants to eat and, and just eat everything. And if I don't balance myself, it'll be, it'll be bad. <laughs> what do you think drives your passion in tennis now? Because I, I know that you've started the adventure. Prince, in, yeah, in, in, in partner the Prince. with partner. So I, I was a partner in Prince before I liked tennis. I thought what was cool about it was the, it was like a country club brand from my childhood. Mm -hmm. Agassi, this one, that, you know, they all had the princes. And I just think there's something about a, a heritage American brand like this that's iconic. And to see it go down so much and now it's so, so much on the rise has been such a cool thing for me to bring it back to life. What is your ideal to see maybe in the next few years? So uh, with Prince, listen, I think it's it's one of these, we're doing so many cool collabs that I think it's uh, it's growing as it is. And people had a moment of time with Prince, a lot of people, whether they were tennis players or not, Prince was such a cool brand back then. Mm -hmm. I like the nostalgic of it. Uh, and I like being an, I love brands that are iconic brands. And I think uh, people want to want Prince to succeed. So that's super cool. On the hospitality side, I, um, you know, we're trying to go out of Miami. We're opening Komodo in Dallas, uh, doing five spots in Vegas. Uh, Pharrell and I are doing a resort in the Bahamas, and uh, we're doing some restaurants in Doha. And we're looking at Saudi. We're looking at everywhere. But um, global domination. I, I think it's time. <laughs> I mean, that's that's what I'm here for. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and I think for me personally, I think. That's the exciting part, to be able to take what's exciting about Miami and bring it to other markets. I wanted to ask you also, as, as a fan of tennis, what uh, drives you to not only play, but also watch tennis? It's funny because I was really friendly with, I'm really friendly with Stan, right? And, when I, and I remember going to the French Open with him and being like, oh, Five hours, this is crazy. This, the heat, you can't move because his family's there. His girl, and he's superstitious and you have to sit there for the five hours in the sun at the French Open. Going back to seeing tennis last summer as a fan, now going to Wimbledon and stuff like that, it was like, I, I, I wanted more than five hours. Yeah. It's just so different now when you're like obsessed with the sport. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Do you really want to sit five hours on the court? Yeah. Listen, I, 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 have, I have ADD. Two and a half. <laughs> By the way, and, and you know, the next match Stan had, it was only two and a half hours, sadly. Yeah. I so. think that's that's kind of a, a good, good It's a good, good time, two and a half hours a good enough, right? <laughs> five is a lot though, no? Yeah. Do you play a lot of five hour matches? I have not played. My longest match, I think was like 340, three hours, something like that. Or three, three and a half for sure. What have been your um, most challenging collaborations, most fun, something that, you know, kind of just sparked the ideas? It's funny because Reebok made these Groot Reeboks for me as like, a, as like a promotion thing. And then I started talking to them. I'm like, Let's, why don't we do Prince Reebok? There was a time where Michael Chang had the right, and he was playing with, you know, Reebok and the whole thing. And it turned out to be a really cool thing for me. Mm -hmm. And that was like, I'm getting to, to do a collaboration with an iconic brand. And I thought that was, for me, really cool that, you know, Reebok, I always think of as another level. And the fact that I could get them excited about doing something with Prince was really rewarding for me. You know, for me, what's kind of interesting to see with uh, my son is the 
the reflection that you see in them of yourself. And it's like, I, I learn through him how to better myself because it's like, I need to be an example and not say what he needs to do and kind of show him what I think is the right, is the right thing. I have one daughter that's incredibly sweet, loving, all that, and I have another daughter, my second daughter, uh, Vida, who's tougher. Yeah. And to see the two differences, but yeah. Yeah, it's it's really, you can see that people really have their own identity. Yeah. And, um, but yet they love, it. I mean, they love being sisters, and I think that's the coolest thing yeah. ever. You know, in, in, in sport, I talk a lot about people, how parents are such a big role in in their lives, and a lot of parents maybe weren't satisfied with their childhood. career choice or childhood. And you see that, you know, pushing on on onto the kids. How supportive were your parents and what you were doing? So my parents, you know, um, by being a divorced, you know, you get little bits of both. And they weren't quite like that at all. Um, and I'm not like that with my kids, thank God. You know, I just really want my, my kids to be happy and healthy. That's really, at the end of the day, because I know the rest, it, it'll come no problem, but yeah. I just want them to be super happy. And it's funny how your whole mode changes with your kids. You want to just keep them so safe and protected. Yeah. And it changes the way you, you deal with people as well, right? You, yeah. yeah. My attorney's a female, and she messed up on something, and I got really angry. And then she said to me, she goes, would you let anyone talk to Kaya that way, my daughter? And I, ever since then, I could never raise my voice. I could never do anything. And I'm glad she did, because it puts it in perspective for me. No, I wouldn't want anyone to talk to my daughter the way I, I, had, I, I was upset at that moment. And it, I was like, this is not fair that you just did this to me. This is like kryptonite you just put on me. <laughs> and now she gets a free ride. If, God forbid, she makes a mistake, it doesn't matter. I'm like, yeah, OK. <laughs> We'll just keep it going, but uh, it's funny. She said this to me, and it sticks to me all the time, and I enter every conversation with that mindset, like what I want someone to talk to my... How, however, I would want someone to talk to my daughter, so I'm going to talk to people. You actually put that in my, in my thought as well, because it's, you know, it's, it's one of the things that I start to be so mindful of, and I'm not perfect, you know, when you see kids or... Um, or somebody, some fans come up to you and you're like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm busy. I also see my kid and wanted to, you know, take a picture with somebody. Of and course. now I do, and now I do. I was in Australia and Leo wanted to take a picture with Nadal. And, you know, like you come up and you like ask and can you take a picture? I feel like that awkward. <laughs> I felt so <laughs> awkward, but it was just like, it makes you think like, oh my God, like it's, it's, it means so much to them that it's like changes completely my perspective of seeing things. And a lot of people also ask me like, would I want my son to play tennis? And kind of going through not great things you right. know, on your path to it. You know, again, you want your kids to be so safe and you want to protect them, but protect them from everything is not going to be a possible. But possible. I, well, I, I think it is possible. I'm not going to let them ever leave home. My <laughs> okay. wife says they don't have to leave. I said, great. Even when they get married, we're going to keep them, we're going to go to a guest house for them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is, is that, that's not how you really think. No, no, it's it? really how I think. Let me be super clear. Okay. My kids are never <laughs> okay. leaving. Uh, okay. But that being said, uh, yeah, you want, listen, you want them to be successful and you want them to be strong and, but I still want them to, I still want to protect. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that's a job of a parent, right? right. So to protect, provide, and guide. And, and that's, that's one of the things I hope, you know, in 15 years or whatever, that my son knows that he, I'm going to be there whenever, whatever, whatever he needs. But I don't want to be the pushing, you know, person, even though I didn't have that person in my life right. who was, you know, like, uh, really pushing me to do what they wanted me to do. I was lucky enough that I had pe parents who uh, supported what I wanted to do and just wanted me to be the best at what I wanted, you know. When did you realize that this is what you want to do professionally? When I was nine years old, I've told this story, I was in my living room and we had this like um, carpet and it looked like uh, a baseline a service line, a square, and the way the furniture was positioned, we had a couch, it looked like a net and stuff. And I vividly, very vividly remember the moment that 
I was imagining myself playing on Wimbledon. I played against Steffi Graf, Monica Seles in French Open. And I was winning. Like, I actually imagined, like visualized it. Nobody has taught me. So I think from, like, deep inside, I think I was destined to do what I do. So, and that time, were you already playing a lot of tennis at nine? Uh, no, I was only two years playing tennis, two years. But you knew. Yeah, it was just like... They had measured your arms anyway, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> I, was not, I was not athletic. I was not athletic. I was running with my legs, like, on the side. Like, I didn't know how to run properly. Were you an awkward fitness person when you were younger? Or were you, like, your arms are too... I, I was coordinated, but right. I was, you know, I was tall. I was really skinny. I was tall. And I did, what helped me is that I did a lot of sports. Once I got into tennis, because I kind of started to get into tennis when I went to school. Before that, I was, I had an older brother. So I was, you know, outside a lot, just right. playing kind of following what he would, what he would do. Um, and then not following what he would do, yeah. which <laughs> saved me. <laughs> so, but it was just like, I started to, uh, was as soon as I started tennis, it was like everything. It was football, it was basketball, it was table tennis. We had table tennis with tennis. So I started to just do everything, athletics, gymnastics, like whatever we could do. Like, I mean, we played table tennis with, you know, the the plastic boxes of uh, tennis strings. Really? That was what we would do. Like we would uh, play handball or like whatever was available because we had no phones, we had no electronics. It was just outside. No like, social media. No social media. My mom, I was begging my mom to let me play outside. Like, I mean, I, it's, a lot of parents had to push their kids to just like go outside. Right. Though, right? <laughs> and I think the, the multi culture that we are like, when I grew up, I didn't really have a multi culture right, culture. environment. Yeah, it's one culture, kind of two, because I don't really put together, you know, all the Eastern European nations. Um, but it's it's still it's very kind of limited. And now with with the world being, you know, so mixed, um, I mean, coming to Miami, I think you can tell how rich the culture, how diverse sure. the culture is. That's what fascinated me about the United States is the mix of of people and the brilliance of it and and how those ideas put together from different parts of the world can make something so amazing. That's that's I think that's my idea of the American dream, the way I see it from coming here, is that mixture of of people, ideas put together. Because I think in all collaborations, right, in business, in sports, team always makes success. You don't do everything by yourself. That's, at least that's how I see it. I think that's the challenging thing in my business is how do you, for me, I want to elevate all the people around me so I don't have to be there so much. I want people to know that there's this guy and that guy and this girl and this woman and that those people are just as important as I am, so it's okay if you see them and not me. Mm -hmm. So it's about how do you elevate the people around you and bring up. Yeah, and sometimes they they, they don't come back, <laughs> right? And then that's sometimes okay. you create your own competition. Yeah, and that's okay too. Listen, uh, for me, competition's healthy. Yeah, I, I I absolutely agree with that, and that's something in sport. I welcome. I think that competition makes you better. 100%. I, I always thought that. I will always think that. And you know, when I see when I see some young girls now, I always think of that point. Like, I love talking to them. I love to. I mean, I don't talk about mentoring, but if somebody comes and asks me for advice. I'm very eager to do that because I, that's something that I craved for right. when I was a kid, and I wish I had that. I still crave it. Yeah. Yeah, you are, you're right. But it's 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 what makes me really really happy to do yeah. is to. To, to help and when I see somebody like young kids and they have that, some of them have the mentality of, you know, you you can have friends, you can have, you know, this, you have to just like, you be, you know, uh, so focused minded that is very close to me because I feel like they're missing a lot of life. Right. You know, a lot of interest, a lot of fulfillment because like in tennis, it's, it's your life, it's your passion, it's your job, but it's not everything that you have. And um, in terms of competition, it's like we are competitive on the court 
and that's never going to change. But off the court, there, we are still, you know, human beings. And I think if I can bring somebody up, somebody can do that for me. And it's a chain that, that, that goes. And, and I think that part is unfortunately sometimes missing now in the world, but I still feel hopeful. You know, one thing I think you should really talk to the up and coming, the next generation is don't be worried about the fee so much or the sponsorship or whatever that is. Worry about getting equity in that brand. And I've seen that kind of tide turn over the last few years, even with my own wife. Listen, she, they asked her to be a model or the face person of a certain brand. She goes, that's, that's great and I'm happy to do it, but I'd like to have the equity and not the, not the fee. Yeah. Because that's how you gain real wealth. Like, you know, everyone, when, I, when someone's applying for a job for me or an executive position, they just want to talk about their salary. And I'm like, you know I'm opening 28 places in two years. Shouldn't you try to be talking to me? How do you vest? How do you, become, how do you get equity? Because the multiple on that is so much more on a salary or a fee that you're going to pay taxes on once you pay your mortgage and this and that. There's really nothing there. But to gain real wealth, it's when companies exit and being an entrepreneur, that's how you make the real money. Yeah. I think that's what the next generation is starting to learn because I think this next generation is the hustle generation. They're all about being entrepreneurs and hustling and this and that. It's exciting. It's inspiring. But you have to make sure that people know that as well. Yeah, and they don't lose the value, right? Their values <laughs> with that hustle. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I meet these, these founders, you know, because being who Miami is right now, I, I meet one or two founders a day. And these kids are coming out of Yale, Stanford, and they're... They're shaking, but these guys are going to be the ones that are changing the world with their new companies and brands and stuff like that. And I think it's so cool. Yeah, I think it is. Uh, and, you know, we talked about it earlier is also athletes becoming, you know, such entrepreneurs and company. Incredible. It's 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 really changed over the last few years. And uh, that's something that hopefully we'll see on a more global uh, global field. And with sports moving and... Especially in tennis, it's such a social sport. You know, it's like, yeah. it really puts you in that position to, I've closed so many deals now on the tennis court. <laughs> so many, it's crazy. They come and train with me for an hour. We play a little tennis and I, and I get deals done. It's been incredible. Mm -hmm. I've used tennis as a real platform for me to get deal flow. Wow. It's, in, it's awesome. It's so cool. I think tennis is, the, is one of the coolest sports out there because it's really technique. It's not just, it's, it's a lot of stuff. It's just not hit a ball. It's, there's a technique behind it. How much technique do you actually pay attention well, to? I've you, seen if, the videos. If, of, if you ask of, my friends, if you ask my <laughs> friends, not much. <laughs> but I try, and it's funny, when I, 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 if, I, if I travel and I can't play tennis for two or three days, I lose my forehand completely. How come? Well, I don't know. We I need to go on the court and I, I yeah, need to see that. I, I'll lose it and I'll be like, it's like starting over from scratch for me right now. Like yeah. I was gone for th three weeks and now I'm back on, I played a lot when I was in South Africa and Saudi Arabia, not too much. I did play with a Saudi Arabian girl that's 17 years old and she's like the next pro for Saudi Arabia. And to hear her struggle through a sport that just came to a country basically, and that she doesn't have much competition, she's beating the boys, she's, she, she has to seek out yeah. competition. It's to see what she's going through, it's really interesting, so. Yeah, we, uh, I mean, I would love to see, every time I hear some stories, actually recently in Australian Open, there were juniors, a girl from Kenya yeah. and from Iraq that played in the Australian Open, which was like, wow, that's, that's really groundbreaking. So for me, that's part of legacy that I would love to see after I, I start playing tennis is the outreach of countries, players, women that have opportunity to be introduced to tennis. Why do you have to do it after you get done playing? Why can't you do no, it? No, 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 I'm saying I, like, <laughs> that's, that's, that's one of the things I want to, not, not to focus after I'm done, is, is that I've helped to do that. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's the legacy of, that's, that's an ongoing project now, and that's my, 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 my true passion. But I'm saying like, once I leave tennis, is like, they ask what, what was the best thing about oh, my okay, journey? Good. That would be that would be the one. Yeah, I mean, listen, I teach a I taught a college class now twice, and I go and speak at all these schools, and I do it because I think it's important to 
live my legacy now and, and do that now because there's stuff they don't teach you in college that you only know from being on the court or exactly. in the mix of things that they have to know that they don't just teach you like your coach is not going to teach you your 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 teacher is not going to teach you that I think it's important that they need to know that now yeah and the theoretical study right is you are going to to those universities and you are being an example and it's and it's kind of going back what I said about the way I look at parenting is that you have to show people how to do it and not not to talk about it and that's part of a uh, school situation that was a bit harder for me in certain subjects in certain areas that you know a theory you don't know how to use that or where to apply that right. and it and it and it gets uh and it gets lost it gets lost like i don't remember a bunch of things that i learned from school that maybe i don't use it in my life or wasn't taught to me the way it can be engaging right. i went to to harvard business uh school for courses and i went to just classes and I was so excited to to be there because it was an interactive I'm going experience. Sunday. Really? I'm speaking at Harvard on Sunday. I'm a keynote speaker and I'm excited. Oh, it's amazing. And I've had some great talks with Anita, who lives yeah. in business school, and she's super cool. We're going to do a case study. And I teach uh, at Cornell twice a year, but FIU Hospitality, which is our local university, I do an actual the David Grutman Experience class. And to be able to I need to I need to come on that. It's when, amazing. When can, I, when can I sign up? So it's eight three-hour classes. Are you in for that? Eight three-hour, yeah. Yeah, each class is three hours. I always surprise them with somebody, obviously. I don't tell them who. And uh, to break down what's so easy for you to do every day of your life, to be able to teach it, is so hard. Yeah. Like, how do you have great relationships? How do you break that down to show someone how to have a great relationship? It's so natural to me. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's cool. I think it's really, it's super rewarding for me. It's probably the hardest thing I've ever done, but yet it's probably the most rewarding thing I've ever done. That's, that's really, that's really awesome. So I'm going to sign up. Yeah. We're going to get you into the David Grubman experience. It's a three credit course. We'll get you going. You know, it'd be great for you to come and speak to the class too. They would love that as well. I would love to. Hey, this is what it's all about, right? Is the, the coupon the system, the coupon system. Relationships. I have a couple of um, very simple, but questions that you need to really think about. So are you ready for them? Let's go. What is your favorite word? Wow. Wow. What is your least favorite word? Um, hospital. If it wasn't for what you do now, what is one of the jobs that you would love to do? Um, I'd love to be an attorney. Really? Yeah. I think law is so cool. Yeah. Or, or government's and, very cool too. Any particular type of law? Trial. I'd love to be a trial attorney, to be honest with you. Yeah. That's that's pretty interesting. Um, what is one job you would never? Oh, or a superhero. Do? Obviously, I'd love to be a superhero. <laughs> that's, that's right. I mean, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> what would be your superpowers? Wow, that's a great question. That's not on. That's not on the on the list. We're I gonna mean, get it. Though. Obviously, X-ray vision would be great. I yeah. think that's cool, and you can see through things. I don't know. Yeah. Mine yeah. would be mine would be to trans transport. Oh yeah, transport's like, yeah. crazy. That's to be just, able to just go like that and transport yeah. anywhere. You don't need the amazing. jet anymore, right? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Spend a lot of money on that. <laughs> okay. So what is the profession that you would never want to do? Mm, I never want to be an accountant. I hear that a lot of people. Or a dentist. <laughs> yeah. But we all need those, right? Or a urologist. I probably don't want to be a urologist either, to be honest with you. I'm not really into urology. Okay. <laughs> what is one quality that you admire about people? Uh, people that are super, that see things differently. Um, mm. yeah, by being part of Pharrell, he, think, he sees things much differently than I see it. And I always am a, amazed by how he sees things so much differently than I see him. I, uh, I've had a chance to meet him once, uh, actually with Serena, we went to his concert yeah. in Paris, and he's fascinating. He's, I mean, he's, he's really, really fascinating person. I, I'm never, I never take it for granted that I'm able to f FaceTime with him or meet with him and talk to him and, and do these projects together because yeah. it just is such a different perspective. Yeah. Then I see things. Yeah, it's. I mean, in the in the most respectful way, he's like an alien to me. Yeah, I'm telling you, <laughs> I tell people all the time. I'm so lucky to be partners with the Dalai Lama, basically, because he's literally the Dalai Lama. Yeah, 
It's really incredible. Uh, and what is the quality that you don't like about people? Ungratefulness or selfishness. Mm. I can't stand that. Mm. And the last question is, if there was an autobiography that you would write, what would the title be? It's going to be, it's, it's going to work out. It's going to be gonna all right. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> it's all, all going to work out. Thank you for, for being here, for being open and honest in this conversation, for, you know, inspiring next generation and sharing your, your advices. I mean, it's, it's really, really valuable. I hope that people tune in and learn from, from a different perspective. Sure. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for it. Thank uh, you for having me.